members. You've got to have members to have a church. A church is composed of regenerate members and some think they're minor children with them. And we don't mean that as a matter of dispute in this lecture. So just know that any time I mention the regenerate members of the church, I don't mean this as an argument between Baptists and Pado baptists I mean this as, as opposed to someone who would say, a more universalistic position, that the church is indiscriminate from the world. All right? So a church is composed of regenerate members, and some think their children while still minors. These members may meet in a building owned by them corporately, a church, or individually, a home, or in a rented space, but it's the people that are essential. Those people are the church. Without a specific community of people, a Christian church does not exist. Samuel Jones, in 1774, defined a church well, I think, in his summary of church discipline. Quote, A particular gospel church consists of a company of saints incorporated by a special covenant into one distinct body and meeting together in one place for the enjoyment of fellowship with each other and with Christ their head and all his institutions to their mutual edification and the glory of God through the Spirit. All right, what are these institutions of Christ? Well, they are fundamentally the preaching of the gospel and the practice of baptizing believers and or believers and their children and the regular celebration of the Lord's Supper. Why did Christ institute these institutions? Well, for the benefit of Christians, to supply advice and edification, to have the gospel preached to us by word and sign, by lip and life, so a church conducts the public worship of God and works to extend the kingdom of Christ through witness and evangelism. With Christ as its head, such a body is able to choose its elders and deacons, admit and dismiss members, administer church discipline, and follow Christ together however else they may discern that God's word teaches. A church is required to worship and serve God, bearing witness to his word, evangelizing, administering baptism and the Lord's Supper, serving Christians, living life together with love and with holiness and with a unity. The church is to show itself united around the truth, loving to God and each other, and marked by a holiness of life that reflects to the world around God's own holiness. So the church has a mission to display God's glory to his creation. In that sense, it's an exclusive community in that it is only those who have been adopted into his family by faith in Christ who have a rightful place in it. And that place is called membership. So that's first, definition of a church. Second, definition of membership. Positively, how does the Bible present the Christian life? Well, it's a life not lived in isolation, but it's lived out with other Christians. Christianity is a personal religion, but it is not a private religion. Truly following Christ is committed and regular, not a casual and occasional. This is what we mean when we think of being a church member. It is a formal commitment to love and to be loved by those Christians we live around, that we regularly interact with, that we desire to be held accountable by and to be active in holding them accountable. A certain assembly has accepted the responsibility to teach us, to lead us, to love us, to care for us, and to correct us when we need it. The local church is not a natural group of homogeneous friends. Let me just repeat that, and I would love a question about that later when we have our Q&A time afterwards. A local church is not a natural group of homogeneous friends. Now, we can draw many sad experiences from our own lives that would probably evidence that, but I mean that in the sense uh, that we don't set out to cultivate it to be merely an ecclesiastical capturing of an existing social group. Um, we can call them bridges of God. Uh, they are, in fact, I think, tools of Satan. You see in Acts 6 and in Ephesians 3, if we were to dissolve into those pre-existing homogeneous groups, we lose the very witness to the gospel that it seems the Holy Spirit intends. 
carnal homogeneity obscures the supernatural unity that draws and holds Christians together and that displays the gospel to the surrounding world. When church membership is properly understood, it is an expression of the common life that Christians share. It's an expression of relationship as we together comprise one spiritual house, one home. It's a relationship that implies a partnership in the gospel. It involves us in the kind of fellowship we see in the early, cha in the early church, like in Acts chapter 2. Our sharing with each other reflects the way God has so graciously given to us. Church members are to be those who have been called into fellowship with Jesus Christ. That's what Paul assumed as he wrote his letters in the New Testament. Christians are called to be in Christ and to abide in Christ. Daily communion with God is to be expressed in our regular fellowship with the same community of Christians. This is how the image of the local church as the body of Christ becomes a reality. Christians share the same spirit in dwelling. We are called to live out that common concern and love for each other. The love Christians share as a result is supposed to shape our life together. Now, while we can say that all Christians are to be characterized by obeying certain duties toward each other, the individual Christian can't live out those duties to all Christians. Right? I mean, it's the old line that we've heard, if you, if, you, if you say you love everybody, you don't love anybody. Right. We can't carry out these duties in the New Testament toward all Christians. In reality, we leave them out most fully to those that we're regularly around, and especially to those we have committed to work with in our local congregations. In this context especially, we are to honor each other, we are to correct one another, pray for one another, encourage one another. We should build one another up by teaching God's Word to each other, being open to and accountable to one another. Now, individual, small, uh, individual friendships and small group Bible studies may satisfy some aspects of these commands, but the biblical pattern from Acts 2 on is for Christians to be made members of local congregations to whom they are responsible to so live out the Christian life corporately. So even as God did in the Old Testament, so more fully and obviously in the New Testament, God dwells in the midst of His people. Built together, we are God's temple. We are the place where His Holy Spirit dwells. Now, if we are members of a congregation, we will be working together for the spread of the gospel. We will give money to this end. We will pray to this end. We will, as Peter says in 1 Peter 4, use whatever gift we've been given to serve others faithfully, administering God's grace in its various forms. God is glorified by each local body being built up through the various gifts that God's entrusted to it. Love for each other will also lead church members to sacrifice for each other's good. By so doing, we obey God's commands. We experience something of His, of His joy in giving, and we bring Him glory. Church members are those who are committed to sharing their material possessions with their teachers, and so providing for their ministry. Church members are also those who are committed to sharing in Christ's sufferings. Not in any way to help Christ atone for the world's sins, but rather to follow Him in faithfulness and so experience the world's rejection. We are called to suffer for and with Christ and with other believers, whether because of our own sin or the sin of others. And we are called to serve one another in love and even to enjoy one another's company. Every phrase I've used is from the New Testament somewhere about our obligations to each other. Now to consider church membership another way. Consider who defines the membership of a Christian congregation in the New Testament. Did the individual himself? I am a member of this church, I so declare. Well, I don't think so. It appears not from that man in 1 Corinthians 5. Now, he had no right to simply decide that he himself would remain a member of the Corinthian congregation. That was the congregation's responsibility. Thus, Paul addressed the congregation as a whole in the letter. He didn't address the letter to the man in sin. He instructed the congregation to remove the man. Most fundamentally, of course, God defines the membership of a local congregation. It was in Acts 2 that the Lord added to those their number daily, those who were being saved. In a secondary sense, however, the Lord 
the local church entrusts to the Lord has entrusted to the local church the responsibility of defining its own membership. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6, we find Paul appealing to the church members to readmit a disciplined member who had repented. The man in 1 Corinthians 5? We don't know. Perhaps. In 1 Corinthians 5 and in Matthew 18, it was the congregation who had publicly to act to define properly who it was that comprised their number because they decided who was to be excluded from it. So, for example, in the case of the adulterous man in Corinth, the congregation had evidently decided to allow the man to remain a member. And it was precisely this decision that the apostle takes them to task for and rebukes them about. In none of these cases did the individual himself have the simple power to make himself a member of the congregation in the way a regular attender in our own day simply considers himself a member by virtue of his choice to attend. Joining is a congregational act. An individual's desire is necessary, but not sufficient. Once the individual was willing, the willingness of the congregation still had to be secured. In the New Testament, it was the church members who admitted and excluded members because it was the congregation and her leaders that would have to give an account for them. We know from Hebrews 13. Who chose the leaders of the congregation? Well, I would suggest at least in some, member, in some examples in the New Testament, it was church members. Who adjudicated differences? Well, at least sometimes, again, it was the, clearly the church members. Who finally discerned the orthodoxy of the preaching? Well, again, I think I see some things clearly in the New Testament that would suggest at least sometimes it was the church members. Who commissioned missionaries? Church members. Who acted together with their leaders to do important business for the kingdom? Church members. Publicly defined church membership is an idea implicit in the New Testament. Essentially, the membership of a church is composed of those who are regularly admitted to the Lord's table. Let me say that again. Essentially, the membership of a church is composed of those who are regularly admitted to the Lord's table. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapters 5 and 6 excoriated the congregation for allowing to remain in their number those who were unrepentant sinners. Chapter 11, he specifically criticized the, uh, their undisciplined practice of the Lord's Supper. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul refers to one who had been punished by the plenum, the majority, there in chapter 2, verse 6, evidently referring to the action of a majority of, of some defined group, the members of the church at Corinth. Occasionally, the truly regenerate may be discouraged from coming to the table by our practices and hypocrites admitted. But what a local church basically intends to do is to admit to the Lord's table those they take to be regenerate and who are not known to be living in any way contrary to the gospel or the word of God. This is the bare outline of membership. It presumes that the person is not in any unrepentant sin. Therefore, it presumes they have been baptized. It presumes, too, that they are in regular attendance with, you know, a few exceptions. And it presumes, furthermore, a level of relationship being developed in which one is, is known and honestly and transparently known to be repenting of sin. Christian churches are only for sinners. And among those sinners, only for repenting sinners. Occasionally, the truly regenerate may be discouraged, but this is what the church is setting out to do. Now, I can't know all the denominational traditions represented here in this setting and how each of your churches have attempted to be faithful to this. And I can tell you, I don't anticipate uh, that if I were in a first century church, I would expect to see a replica of an 18th century Baptist church members meeting. I don't imagine that. But, but... I can tell you that from the earliest of times, Baptist churches have tended to summarize such duties in church covenants. These Christians accepted that they had duties to pray for their pastors and for each other, uh, to pay their pastors as they could, to respect them, to obey them, to defend them. They usually took these covenants publicly as a way of making themselves accountable to fulfill their duties. They also acknowledged in them that they had a duty to those other members of the congregation to care for them and watch over them. That care